Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the second half of 405. Uh, in this half, we will cover solid state <coughs> physics. As I mentioned many times in the course, uh, any re realistic theory of solids has to include quantum mechanics, so we'll obviously rely on what we learned in the first half of the course. Uh, one thing that we did in the first half of the course was largely look at single particle systems. We talked briefly about two particle systems, such as a helium atom, and the fact that if you have more than one identical particle present, then the wave function is either symmetric or anti-symmetric, depending upon whether or not it's a boson or a fermion. But we didn't talk a lot about multiple particles. And of course, a solid has a very large number of particles in it, something on the order of Avogadro's number, which is 10 to the 23rd. So we have to come up with some theory which can keep track of all the particles, or at least come up with some statistical description of those large number of particles. So that's what we'll develop today. Another thing which you may or may not have noticed thus far is that we've assumed t equals zero Kelvin, and t equals zero Kelvin is not a particularly realistic situation for a lot of solids, so temperature is also a factor. So we have to deal with a very large number of particles and temperature. And this falls into the realm of statistical mechanics, uh, which perhaps you've seen before, but in particular, because we're talking about a quantum mechanical object in this case, we need to do quantum statistical mechanics. So that's what we're after. We're going to cover quantum statistical mechanics for the next day or two. Incidentally, uh, I apologize for the notes not being online yet. My scanner uh, betrayed me. So hopefully that will be sorted out soon. They will go up as soon as it's done. So let's talk about quantum statistical mechanics. At t equals zero Kelvin, a physical system occupies its lowest energy configuration. Okay, I think that's self-evident to, to most people. Of course, t equals zero Kelvin is not particularly realistic, and as a result, the more interesting question is that t greater than zero Kelvin random thermal energy leads to a population of excited states. And what we're going to try to develop is a theory which will tell us what is on average the population of each excited state for a given temperature. Okay. This will be known as some sort of thermal distribution function. And there's three famous ones. We'll derive all three. Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, Bose-Einstein distribution, and Fermi-Dirac distribution function. That's where we're going with this. You may know the result already. Uh, it would be covered in 351, for example, but we'll derive how you get to that result using quantum statistical mechanical methods. There are also thermodynamical methods for getting to them, which you may have seen before. This is a different approach. Okay, so this is what we're after. Let's phrase the question more precisely. And in particular, keeping in, tr keeping in mind that we have a large number of particles. So if we have a large number, n, of particles in thermal, equi thermal equilibrium, at a temperature T, what is the probability that a given particle will have a specific energy E sub j. Okay. Now this question, because the word probability is in it, may make you think that this is somehow related to quantum indeterminacy, which of course led to us developing a probabilistic theory. But that was a probabilistic theory for each individual particle. 
This question is asking what is the probability if you have a large number of particles for one to be at a particular energy level. The exact same problem exists in classical statistical mechanics because there's no way you can keep track of all 10 to the 23rd particles in your solid, independent of whether or not the underlying mechanics is deterministic or not. So this is a problem of large numbers. We can't write down I, or we can't write down Newton's laws for 10 to the 23rd particles and keep track of all of them. We can just say statistically what will happen. Okay? So it's clear to distinguish between these two probabilities. And we're going to derive these for both the classical case where the, where the mechanics is deterministic, that'll give us the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, and for quantum particles, fermions and bosons, where the underlying mechanics uh, is not deterministic. To approach this problem, we have to make one assumption, and this is the fundamental assumption of statistical mechanics. That assumption on which the entire theory is based is that in thermal equilibrium, every distinct state with the same total energy E is equally probable. This is a very, very deep statement. Uh, Griffiths in his book recommends you sit down and meditate on this statement. Uh, think about what it means, where it comes from. I'll uh, allow you to do that on your own time. Uh, but if you think about it, if this were not the case, it would be very difficult to have conservation of energy because it would suggest that energy would be channeled into particular states which were more probable than others. Um, so this is an assumption, though. It's, it's not something we can prove. So if you disagree with it, uh, then you can disagree with the remaining theory, but we'll assume it's the case in this class. That's the fundamental assumption of statistical mechanics. The temperature, the total energy matters, right? Because we're saying that all states with the same total energy is equally probable. The temperature, T, is simply a measure of the total energy of the system in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So this is what we're after. We're going to try to answer that important question on the upper right by employing this fundamental assumption. Temperature will be just some means of measuring the total energy in the system. We want to develop a theory. What I'm going to show is that depending upon what type of particle you have, you get a different answer to that first question. And there's three classes of particles. Classically, particles are distinguishable. Okay. In other words, we could label it red, blue, green, etc. And it would forever be red, blue, and green. And we could tell them apart. Counting distinguishable particles is different than counting identical particles. So that's going to be one class, so-called distinguishable particles. Quantum mechanically, particles are identical, can't tell them apart, and as we talked about in the first half of the course, they fall into two classes. They're categorized by their spin, but for our purposes, it's more important that their wave functions have to be symmetric or anti-symmetric. Those two classes are fermions, for example, electrons, and bosons, for example, photons or phonons. So both of these are going to be quite important. Incidentally, there will be some materials 
where they will behave as if they're classical particles. For example, non-degenerately doped semiconductors behave classically and follow Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. This will imply dramatically different properties as a result. The nature of the particle implies dramatic differences in properties, and that's what, of course, material science is about, developing structure, property relationships. So that's where we're going with this. So to answer this first question, the probability of, of a particle having a particular energy is going to depend on the type of particle. And in particular, how do we count <coughs> the distinct states in these cases. All right, if you want to calculate the probability of something, you need to know how many are in that particular case and divide it by the total. So prob probabilistic theories are just a matter of accounting, keeping track of the particles. And so statistical mechanics is uh, basically a problem in statistics or elementary probability. So if you've had an elementary probability class before, this will be uh, trivial today. If not, I'll try to highlight the poignant features to you. Before we talk about the general case, because the general case is going to be 10 to the 23rd particles, let's talk about three particles. And what I want to show you is that if we have three particles and we put them in some potential, for example, an infinite potential well in 1D, that the probability of getting a particular energy will differ based on what type of particle you have. And as a result, we'll see that we would expect these three cases to lead to different behaviors in the limit of very large numbers. So let's try this example. Three non-interacting particles in the 1D infinite square well. Okay? We know this problem. The total energy would be the sum of the three particles energies, which I'm labeling A, B, and C. And we know that these energies are just pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared times Na squared for particle A plus Nb squared for particle B plus Nc squared for particle C. We solved this problem before, and we know that there are constraints on these quantum numbers, and A and B and N C are equal to positive integers. Okay. So we're trying to find the probability of a particular energy uh, being occupied. So if the total energy was equal to a specific number, say 363, times pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared, that would of course imply that the sum of the squares of the three quantum numbers is simply equal to 363. Okay. And the question is, what are the possible values for Na, Nb, and Nc? And it turns out there are 13 possibilities. for Na, Nb, and Nc. And let's just write them down. They could all be 11. Okay. 11 squared plus 11 squared plus 11 squared is 363. Two of them could be 13, and one could be 5. And of course, there's three possibilities to arrange two values of 13 and one value of 5 among these three particles. So we could have 13, 13, 5, 13, 5, 13, or 5, 13, 13. We could have 2 equal to 1 and 1 equal to 19. And similarly, there would be three possibilities for that. 1, 1, 19, 1, 19, 1, and 19, 1, 1. In the final case, is one of them to be 5, one to be 7, one to be 17. And you could arrange that in six different ways. So 5, 7, 17, 5, 17, 7, 7, 5, 17, 7, 17, 5, 
17.57 and 17.75. So there's 13 possibilities for these three quantum numbers. Everybody okay with this? Okay. So we're doing this very simple case of three non-interacting particles, and then we'll generalize to arbitrary number of particles. And this is an effective way to handle any probability question. If you can't see the trend for a large number, start with a small number and then build it up one at a time and eventually you'll see the trend. And Griffiths recommends you do this for bosons in particular. It's a homework problem, which uh, you could, I'm probably not going to assign it, but you could do it if you wanted to. He gives it as a problem to build up the boson distribution one particle at a time and then inductively show what it is in the general case. We're going to consider the specific case, the specific case in class. Okay, so there's 13 possibilities. Now let's consider our three cases. If the particles are distinguishable, Each of these possibilities represents a distinct quantum state. Furthermore, each of these states is equally likely. So let me introduce some more notation here. Before I do that, let me ask this question. What is the total number of particles in each state? Or more precisely, i.e., What is the occupation number, which I'm going to call capital N sub lowercase n, for state psi sub n? Okay, so we want to determine these occupation numbers. And just after just one more uh, definition, the collection of all occupation numbers for a given three particle state, so we have three particles in this case, of course in general it will be some n particle state, but in this case for a three particle state, it's called the configuration. So what we want to determine are the configurations that are possible. Okay, so let's try to make this more tangible. Here are some definitions. Let's actually figure this out for the particular case we're talking about. If all three particles are in size of 11, which is one of our possibilities, the configuration would be, so there's none in state 1, so we say that there's n sub 1 is 0. That would be true for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but in 11 we have 3 particles, and of course all additional possibilities are also equal to 0. So in this case, the configuration is such that n sub 11 is equal to 3, and all others are 0. And you notice that there's only one way to get that. So there's a 1 in 13 chance, if you will, of getting this particular configuration. Yeah? Let's take the next possibility. 
if two are in size sub 13 and one is in size sub 5, the configuration would now be equal to, there's obviously 0 and 1, 2, 3, 4. There's 1 and 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 2 and 13, and none of the others are occupied. And so in this case, n sub 5 is 1, n sub 13 is 2, and all others are 0. Okay. We then have the case where we have 1 I'm sorry, we would have 2 in size sub 1 and 1 in size sub 19. And then you can see what the configuration would be in this case. n sub 1 is 2. And we all have to go all the way up to 19 to get 1. So that would be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 1, etc. So here, obviously, n sub 1 is 1. I'm sorry, n sub 1 is 2. And n sub 19 is 1. And all the others are 0. There's only one final possible configuration in this case. And that would be for one of the particles to be in 5, 1 in 7, 1 in 17. So we can write that configuration down. The probability of getting a particular configuration varies. Obviously, there's 3 out of 13 chance of getting this configuration, 3 out of 13 chance of getting that configuration. And so not all configurations are equally likely. That's an important point. So I apologize if this is too uh, elementary, but I think it's useful to you know, get on a firm footing before we go to the general case, which is much more abstract. So let's just complete the analysis. If we have 1 in size sub 5, 1 in size sub 7, and 1 in size sub 17, then obviously the configuration is that there's n sub 5 is equal to 1, n sub 7 is equal to 1, and n sub 17 is 1. Okay. Remember, this one we could achieve in six different ways. And as a result, this is the most probable configuration. Okay. So note, config number 4 is the most probable. 6 out of 13 chance as opposed to 3 out of 13 or 1 out of 13. This becomes extremely important in limit of large numbers. We'll find that the most probable configuration will be something like 10 to the 100th times more likely than the next most probable configuration. And so for all practical purposes on the time scale of the lifetime of the universe, only the most probable configuration matters. That is a very, very important consequence of thermodynamics which I hope you're covering in 401, but I'm not sure. Okay. We'll come back to that point in a minute. If we select one of these particles, at random, What is the probability of getting a specific energy
E sub n. That was the question I just erased and I started the discussion with today. That's what we're after. Once you know that what the probability of each configuration is, within that configuration, you know what the probability of getting a particular energy is, you multiply those two together and that will give you the probability of a particular energy. Unless, of course, that energy can be reached from more than one of the configurations. For example, in this case, we can get to uh, energy five from either the second configuration or the fourth configuration. So you have to sum together those two probabilities. So let's do this analysis. So first consider, we'll look at configuration one. So the probability of configuration number one, oh sorry, let's start with configuration number three. Probability of configuration number three is three thirteenths. There's three ways to get configuration three and there's 13 total. And within this configuration, there's a two-thirds chance of E1 and a one-third chance of E19. And we can't get to E1 or E19 from any of the other three configurations. And as a result, the probability of getting energy equal to E sub 1, which I'm going to call P sub 1, is equal to the probability in configuration number 3, which is 3 thirteenths, times the probability of getting energy 1 within that configuration, which is 2 thirds. And as a result, that probability is 2 thirteenths. Similarly, P sub 19 is equal to 3 thirteenths times 1 thirteenths, or 1 third, which is just 1 thirteenth. So you've determined two terms in the distribution. We're going to try to determine what P sub n for any value of n is equal to. In this case, there's a finite number of possible energies because most of them are equal to zero. Let's try configuration number one now. Probability of configuration number one is 1 thirteenth. And within this configuration, we are certain to get E sub 11, because all three particles are in the 11th state. And as a result, P sub 11 is equal to 1 thirteenth. Configuration number two, we can get out 13, and P13 will be equal to, there's 3 thirteenths chance of being in configuration number two, times the 2 thirds chance of getting the 13th energy within that configuration, and as a result, P sub 13 is just 2 thirteenths. Configuration number four, we can see that P7 and P17 are equally likely and both equal to the probability of being in configuration number four, which is six, thir six thirteenths, times the probability of getting seven or 17, which is one third. And as a result, these two probabilities are two thirteenths. And as I alluded to, the only interesting case is P sub five, because you can get to state five from two different configurations. So you have to, you have to determine each of those probabilities and add them together. So uh, recall what I'm doing here. And I, I acknowledge this is tedious, but it'll be interesting when we look at this exact same problem if the states were not distinguishable. And we'll find that the distribution will be completely different. And that's the point. That's why these three distribution functions look different. It originates from this difference in counting of three different types of fundamental particles. So as I suggested many times now, E sub 5 exists in configs number 2 and number 4. And as a result, P sub 5 will be equal to 3 thirteenths 
probability of being in configuration number two times the probability of that particle within configuration two being, num being state five, which is one-third, plus the probability of being in configuration four, which is six-thirteenths, times the probability of the particle in configuration number four being five, which is one-third, this is just equal to three-thirteenths. One thing you should always do to check that your distribution is correct is that if you sum over all possible quantum states, the probability of being in each of those states, in this case the only non-zero values are p sub 1 plus p sub 5 plus p sub 7 plus p sub 11 plus p sub 13, p sub 17 plus p sub 19. If we plug in all these probabilities we just calculated, this is 2 thirteenths plus 3 thirteenths plus two thirteenths, plus one thirteenth, plus two thirteenths, plus two thirteenths, plus one thirteenth, you'll find this equal to thirteen over thirteen, which is one, which it better be. Part has to be in some state. Okay. So we developed this distribution function for, for distinguishable particles, and that should be easy because that's what you would have done in any you know, high school level probability class is consider distinguishable particles. What's more interesting is the case of quantum particles. So let's consider the case for identical fermions. The most important constraint is Pauli exclusion principle. And if you recall, the Pauli exclusion principle states that no two particles can occupy the same state. And as a result, configs number one, number two, and number three are disallowed. And as a result, you have absolute certainty to be in configuration number four. So there's only three possible energies you could get, and they're all equally likely. And as a result, the distribution for identical fermions is just that p sub 5 equals p sub 7, which equals p sub 17, which equals 1 third. And of course, if you added those three probabilities together, you get 1, as expected. So what I hope you're seeing is that identical fermions and distinguishable particles are completely different. Final case. are identical bosons, and in particular, the symmetrization requirement allows one state for each configuration. Since the energies of those four configurations, um, or at least the distribution of energies, was different in those four cases, then we would expect this to have equal probability for each of the four configurations. And as a result, P sub 1 will just be equal to 1 quarter, the probability of being in that configuration, times 2 thirds, the probability of having the energy equal to 1 within that configuration, which is 1 sixth. P sub 19 will be 1 quarter times 1 third, which is 1 twelfth. P sub 11 is just 1 quarter, because that's probably being in that configuration. Of course, in that configuration, you're certain to get 1 or 11. P sub 13 will be 1 quarter times 2 thirds, which is 1 sixth. P sub 7 will be equal to, equal to P sub 17 equal to one quarter the probability of being in configuration number four times one third the probability of being in seven or seventeen, which is one twelfth. And finally, P sub five is the only interesting case where we could get to it from two different configurations. And as a result, the probability would be one quarter times one third plus one quarter times one third, which is equal to one sixth. 
So again, we see for bosons a completely different distribution than for distinguishable particles or fermions. So the bottom line is that the way in which we count the particles or count the states depends on the nature of the particles. And so we're going to have to generalize this to the arbitrary case of a very large number of particles. Something on the order of 10 to the 23rd that you'd find in a particular or common solid. Is everybody okay with how we did this for the simple case of three particles? Okay. So it's just bean counting. There's nothing more to it than that. If you can keep track of the particles, you'll do fine. You find a lot of solid state physics is just that. Uh, if you're a very organized person, you have very little difficulty with solid state physics because it's just a matter of keeping track of the particles. Semiconductors is a classic example of that. It's all just statistics. Okay. So there's two notes I want to make. One is accounting of the states. Depends on the nature of the particles and so photons will be very different than electrons just statistically speaking. The second note and this is the one I referred to before is that n becomes a large number so in our case we did n equal to 3 so it's obviously not a large number but as n becomes a large number, the most probable configuration becomes overwhelmingly more likely. And as I said, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a little thing. It's not an order of magnitude. It's not two orders of magnitude, something like 100 orders of magnitude more likely for a typical solid. This point is covered in detail in chapter one of Cattell's thermal physics book if you want to read about it. The point is, is that for statistical purposes, we can afford to ignore the other possibilities. So in that sense, the n particle problem is easier than the three particle problem. So all we have to do is identify the most probable configuration. Once we've done that, then we'll know the energy distribution because it's just the probability of getting a particular energy within the most probable configuration. We don't need to calculate the probability of a particular configuration, just so that it is the most probable. So the problem will come down to writing down how many ways there are to achieve a particular configuration. We're going to call that parameter Q. And we're simply going to write down what that parameter Q is and minimize it, or sorry, in this case, maximize it, optimize it to determine what is most probable. Once we determine what is most probable, the distribution of energies within that configuration will be the distribution function we're after. So the bottom line is that the distribution of individual particle energies, which is what we're after, at equilibrium, is simply their distribution in the most probable configuration. And so this problem comes down to doing an optimization problem. And this is one of many reasons why engineers tend to do better in the second half of this course, because optimization is something that we're trained to do as engineers very well. And so we'll do a multivariable optimization problem and use the technique of Lagrange multipliers 
uh, which hopefully you've seen before, in order to solve that problem. Before I jump into that more general case, are there any questions on the specific case and the setup? Okay. So far, so good. What we care about, though, is not the case of three non-interacting particles in the infinite square well potential. What we care about, and what I want you to consider now, an arbitrary potential, so this will be true for any potential, including that of a solid. So the details of the potential are not important from statistical perspective. For an arbitrary potential, for which one particle energies uh, stationary state energies e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3, etc. And since we're typically going to be working in three dimensions, we know that it's quite likely that there will be degeneracies in those energies. So with degeneracies, d1, d2, d3, etc. So that's what we're considering, is some arbitrary potential for which there are stationary state solutions with known degeneracies. So that's what we just did on the exam. You guys calculated stationary state energies for the 3D harmonic oscillator and told me something about the degeneracy. So this is known. We could calculate it for a given potential. If we put n particles, it's now not just three, but capital N particles, into this potential, how many different ways Can a particular configuration, so remember the configuration was these n sub 1, n sub 2, n sub 3, et cetera. We just wrote down a few of them. How many ways can a particular configuration be achieved? And obviously the one which is the greatest number will be the most probable and the only one which matters. Then we just determine how the uh, particles are distributed within that configuration, and we're done. So what we're seeking then, or the answer, which I'm going to call Q, and Q will of course be a function of the configuration. This is a function of these parameters, n sub 1, n sub 2, etc., the occupation numbers. As I alluded to, will depend on whether the particles are distinguishable if they're identical fermions or identical bosons. So we want to calculate is capital Q. And what we know are the stationary state energies and their degeneracies. That's all we know. And of course that will exist for any potential. And so it's a simply a probability exercise. <laughs> How many ways can you arrange a certain number of balls in a certain number of baskets? That type of problem. So let's do the first case. Distinguishable particles. Okay. First question you may ask is, how many ways can we select n sub 1 particles from capital N total to be placed 
in E sub 1. Okay? So what we're doing is we're choosing n sub 1 from n. So the answer to this problem, as is typically taught in introductory algebra, is the binomial coefficient, also commonly referred to as n, choose n sub 1. The notation is n, n sub 1. Or you may have seen this and this type of notation. This notation is equal to n factorial divided by n sub 1 factorial times the difference between n and n sub 1 factorial. Okay, this hopefully looks familiar. Yeah? But it's a little bit more complicated than that because each of the particles has d sub 1 choices, right? Because we have a degeneracy of d sub 1. And so particle 1 has d sub 1 choices, particle 2 has d sub 1 choices, particle 3 has d sub 1 choices, all the way up to n sub 1. And as a result, we have to multiply that by d sub 1 times d sub 1 times d sub 1 n sub 1 times. And as a result, the total number of possibilities will be equal to the binomial coefficient, which is n factorial divided by n sub 1 factorial times n minus n sub 1 factorial times d sub 1 to the n sub 1 power. Everybody okay with this statement here? I right, can't tell if I'm going too slow or too fast. I guess I'll keep going. For the second energy, the analysis is the same. But there are only n minus n sub 1 particles left. So it's the exact same problem, except now this becomes n sub 2, and this becomes n minus n sub 1. And so you can see that the total number of possibilities in this case will just be equal to n minus n sub 1 factorial, because we've replaced n with n minus n sub 1, times d sub 2 to the n sub 2 power, because we've replaced n sub 1 with n sub 2, and of course d sub 1 with d sub 2, divided by n sub 2 factorial times n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 factorial. And this would be true now for n sub 3, n sub 4, all the way up to n sub n. And as a result, what we're seeking, which is Q, for a particular configuration, is equal to the first term, which we showed was n factorial times d sub 1 to the n sub 1 power, divided by n sub 1 factorial times n minus n sub 1 factorial, times the second term, which is n minus n sub 1 factorial, d sub 2 to the n sub 2 power, divided by n sub 2 factorial times n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 factorial. The third term will be n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 factorial d3 to the n sub 3 divided by n sub 3 factorial times n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 minus n sub 3 factorial, etc. all the way up to n sub n. Of course, when this goes to n sub n, then this term will just be 0 factorial, which is just 1. Every other term will cancel, as you can see. So all that survives is going to be the n sub 1, n sub 2, n sub 3 factorials, the d sub 1 to the n sub 1, d sub 2 to the n sub 2, etc. in the numerator, and n factorial. 
And so we can write this as n factorial times d sub 1 to the n sub 1, d sub 2 to the n sub 2, d sub 3 to the n sub 3, dot, 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 divided by n sub 1 factorial divided by n sub 2 factorial divided by n sub 3 factorial. Well, this is commonly written as an infinite product. The infinite product symbol is capital pi if you've never seen it before, as, composed, as opposed to capital sigma, which is used for the summation sign. So it's an infinite product from n equals 1 to infinity of d sub n to the n sub nth power divided by n sub n vectorial. Can everybody see that this is the value of Q? How many ways we're able to achieve a particular configuration? It's equal to this. Okay. What we'll do next time is do the same analysis for identical fermions. Of course, polyexclusion principle is in play. We'll do the same analysis for identical bosons. That's the most conceptually difficult case. We'll have these values of Q, and then what we'll do is optimize them. We'll try to maximize them. We'll maximize them using the approach of Lagrange multipliers. And from that, we'll be able to deduce the three famous distribution functions, Maxwell-Boltzmann for distinguishable particles, Fermi-Dirac for identical fermions, and Bose-Einstein for identical bosons. Once we have that in place, uh, then we will develop a theory of solids which will exploit these distribution functions. Okay, see you next time.